Hello, welcome again to Global Expansion of ES 2010. My name is Lucas Spies with Global Capiche. This is session three on global finance and trade. I did make a modification to this week's routine in that we will not be covering the labor and HR. Uh, it just is because global finance has uh, a lot of areas to talk about and to even touch on on a portion of them through this whole week's lecture. So I will try to put in the HR in the last week, but for now this is what we're going to discuss, global finance and trading. Let's get started. There are three views to global trade, liberal, economic, nationalist, and Marxist. The liberal is concerned with the benefits in economic trade and believes in comparative advantage as a tool for worldwide economic growth. We'll get into competitive advantage in a second. The economic nationalist is concerned with the security and stability of the whole nation and tends to view the global trade environment as a zero-sum game where if one country uh, expands its, its global income, for lack of a better word, it will come at the cost of another nation. So economic nationalist is concerned with keeping trade up but in the home country. The Marxist view is the final view and that believes that the world trade has a negative impact on the world and in particular exists to exploit impoverished nations. The Marxist view. Comparative advantage. Uh, I put on here a coffee and microchips example. I'm going to just use these two products as a basis for uh, this subject. Comparative advantage is a view that you can get an advantage all around the world. The whole world can prosper better through global trade. And the coffee and microchips means that, okay, so let's say you have, let's say you have two countries. One country that can produce coffee more efficiently than any other country, and it can also produce microchips better than any other country. And you have a second country that can produce microchips not as efficiently as the first country, but it still can produce those microchips. It is better for the first country to produce all coffee and buy the microchips from the other country, even though that country produces less efficiently, because then everybody is winning. Everybody is winning through the production of coffee and also microchips and it comes at a, at a it's, in other words, it's not a zero sum, it creates a synergy of production. So the whole world would prosper through comparative advantage. I did want to get into the Asian financial crisis. This here is uh, well, it was a devastating issue in 1997. And what it has to do with the financial environment is that up until the Asian financial crisis, you saw a lot of foreign direct investment that was coming into uh, the Asian area, uh, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, uh, even some parts of India. Now, what had happened was that this huge influx of capital grew a whole bunch of factories and businesses that previously did not exist. So now you have all this production that is happening in Southeast Asia that, that was not happening before. Then, and this is still uh, based upon kind of hearsay, but there, the, there was a financial pressure on the currency Thai baht that undervalued, that said that the Thai baht was overvalued. So you had these financial, these foreign exchange speculators that speculated that the Thai baht was going to crash and they said that, well, we think that this Thai baht is, uh, is, is overvalued and that it's really not worth that much. And what we're going to do is we're going to short this currency. And shorting is a, uh, an economic, it's a way that you can buy and sell and try and, 
and make a profit uh, based on, on your idea that a currency may uh, fall in price. So they shorted the Thai bot and uh, once some of these high powered investors started shorting it, a whole bunch of other people jumped on this bandwagon and you had all, the whole world basically screaming at the Thai bot saying that it's overvalued and then all of a sudden all this financial capital that went into Southeast Asia and Thailand, Thailand in, in particular came flying back out of the currency or of, of the economy there. And what that, when, when that happened, the Thai bot crashed and that put a major strain on the whole southeastern area of production and you had an economic crisis because of, of, this, of this currency situation. And we'll, get, we'll kind of talk more about that in a bit, but uh, I wanted to bring this attention here because this is uh, very important in that uh, up until this point, the world had never seen these kinds of swings of financial capital, and it paved the way for some of the uh, other discussions that are going on in, in uh, economics. Okay. IMF, World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. I wanted to mention this slide here because these are all, they all play a part in the modern day economy and financial situation. The International Monetary Fund, uh, it's first and foremost an overseer of its members' monetary and exchange rate policies and a guardian of the Code of Conduct. Code of Conduct is uh, more or less a contract that countries have to sign up to in order to gain some of the benefits from the IMF. And uh, by benefits, uh, by, being, by participating in the IMF, you are, you are guaranteed a, a certain amount of uh, security as a country, uh, security, monetary security, uh, but you do have to relinquish some of your control for that. So that's what the IMF does. The World Bank is mostly for uh, development, and they they give loans to countries. Uh, sometimes the, the loans are questionable in terms of what the countries have to give up for these loans. Um, but the goal of the World Bank is to reduce the world's poverty. And the World Trade Organization is an international organization designed by its founders to supervise and liberalize uh, international trade. So the WTO's goal is to open up trade barriers and uh, really put forth the what we talked about before, the comparative advantage. The Washington Consensus is uh, basically means stabilize, privatize, and liberalize. What this refers to is that when countries take out loans with the World Bank for their development, they are expected to meet certain conditions to receive that money. So they typically have to sell off publicly held services, such as telecom is a good example. Um, sometimes uh, maybe in oil production or something like that, they have to sell off and make it private in order to receive the development funds that they want to, to expand and to spur growth. So the loans from the World Bank come at a hefty price. And you can see on the slide that we have a picture. This is the uh, Indonesian uh, official and uh, an official from the World Bank who is overseeing uh, the signature of the contract. You can see the look, the grim look on his face that you know this is serious business. And there, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of question into this in that they say that you know they give these loans to countries that have no possible way of being able to pay them back. So uh, it kind of goes along with uh, our modern day economic crisis where so many people took on loans that they were not able to, to pay back and uh, basically so many companies were just trying to close a deal, close a deal. And now you know, look where it got us. Um, this is that on a much, much, much bigger scale. Countries taking out loans from you know, hundreds of billions of dollars or, or significant sums of money and are expected to put forth all these conditions for that 